All right, um, we're going to start first. Well, we're going to be reviewing free response and multiple choice as we go. Uh, test is on Monday and Tuesday, so we're going to review for quite a while for this. Uh, just because we haven't done a whole lot of uh, free response, quite frankly. So here we go. A function f has derivatives of all orders at x equals 0. Let p sub n of x denote the nth degree Taylor polynomial for f about x equals 0. It is known that f of 0 is negative 4 and that the first degree Taylor polynomial is negative 3 when we plug 1 half in. Show that the first derivative is 2. All right, with your partner, give it a try. This one's a little tricky, actually. But after I show you, it won't be hard again. It'll be tricky right now. That's good. That's solid advice. You're welcome. All right, so here's, here's some hints. And you don't have to write this piece down, but p sub n of x, we've got to think about how we construct a polynomial. It's f of 0 in this case, and we're approximating the, the function when we plug 1 half in. So right now we're doing Maclaurin. Then, then you do f prime of 0, and you put x. Then how about a couple more? f, prime of, f double prime of 0, x squared over 2 factorial, and then third derivative x to the third over 3 factorial, and you'd keep going in that fashion. That's how we develop, that's how we build these polynomials. Well, now we're going to approximate um, a half, and it says p sub 1 of a half is negative 3. So p sub 3 of 1 half, they're saying, is has a value of negative 3. So that's equal to f of 0, which is negative 4, plus they want us to show the value of f prime of 0, so that's actually our variable, let's say. That's what we're actually solving for. And then this x right here, we've plugged 1 half into, because that's where we're doing the approximation. So that's going to be times 1 half, and that's all the information that we need. We don't have to keep going with this. So that's a negative 4. We add 4, which is 1. That's f prime of 0 and then multiply by 2. So f prime of 0 is equal to 2, and we've built the polynomial, and we showed at least, you know, two steps. We added the 4 and we multiplied the 2. There it is. That's it. That's it. The tough part of that is knowing what to do. Of course, adding 4 and multiplying by 2 is the easy part. That's the easy part. All right, b. b should be pretty straightforward for you. It is known that the second derivative is negative 2 thirds and the third derivative is 1 third. Find p sub 3 of x. I've pretty much told you how to do it. Give it a try. So p sub 3 of x, we got negative 4, and we said that the second, our first derivative was 2, and then minus 2 thirds x squared over 2 factorial, and then plus 1 third x to the third over 
3 factorial. So there's the polynomial. All right, the function h has first derivative given by h prime of x is f of 2x. It is known that h of 0 is 7. Find the third degree Taylor polynomial for h about x equals 0. So let's take the first sentence here. The function h has first derivative given by, so h prime of x is f of 2x. So this, is, this represents f of x right here. So negative 4 plus 4x. Let's start canceling a little bit so we don't have so many numbers. If I cancel the 2s here, then we have minus 4x squared over 3, because I'm squaring, squaring 2. That's where we get the 4 on that one. Then uh, how about the bottom is 6 times 3, that's 18. So then plus, or excuse me, no, that's 18, I got it. Uh, 8x to the third over 18, because I'm taking 2 to the third, that's where we get the 8. So there's f of 2x, I've represented h prime of x. It is known that h of 0 is 7, that's an initial condition. There's your initial value right there for an integral. Find the third degree Taylor polynomial for h about x equals 0. So now we're going to integrate both sides. Integrate both sides. So h of x is equal to, now notice how the powers increase. We write these polynomials really backwards. So instead of putting the constant on the end like we usually do with uh, uh, integrals, we actually put these on the front. So if I plug 0 in, we get 7. That's what it said. I just, it's off the screen a little bit. We plug 0 in, we get 7. So the constant 7. Antiderivative negative 4 is minus 4x plus 2x squared. And then uh, minus uh, 4x to the third over 9. It says third degree, so be careful. Don't go too far. Don't do that x to the fourth because it says find the third degree. You might lose a point if you go too far with it. There we go. Questions on this one? Uh, you should probably know how this is graded so that you know what to expect on the test. A uses p sub 1 of x. Uses p sub 1. Uses. Uh, that's probably right here. Using that. Verifies that it's actually 2. So adding 4, dividing, or multiplying by 2. That's probably one point. First two, first two terms. So first two terms are a point, and then third term, and then fourth term. But I would take it from here also, because you don't have to reduce. So I would look at either one. Now, if you reduce and you make a mistake, that'll cost you the point. So I encourage you to reduce very little, only, only when you feel it, it would be necessary. Only when you feel it would help you do the problem applies h of prime of x is f of 2x. That would, that's sitting right here, plugging in 2x. And of course, did we, we simplified a little bit, so we actually did that. Uh, that would help us take the antiderivative. Oh no, that, mm, that is the antiderivative. So I don't know, right here would be one, no, two points. The constant term would be a point, and then the remaining terms is the other point. There we go. The function g has derivatives of all orders in the Maclaurin series for g is, they give you the sigma notation, they give you a few terms. A, using the ratio test, determine the interval of convergence in the Maclaurin series for g. Go. They even tell you what to do there. And really, you only have two choices. You only have ratio test or, or it's geometric. That's the only really two choices you have. So thank you for telling us what to do, but we could have figured that out. Now we have limit as n approaches infinity of about x to the 2n plus 3 over 2n plus 5.
times 2n plus 3 over x to the 2n plus 1. Well, the n's are going to be 2 over 2, that's 1, so this really comes down to x squared has to be less than 1, because there's a 2 extra x's on top. Now, I don't have absolute value because I don't need it. we got x squared, but we're going to square root. Absolute value of x now is less than 1, so negative 1 less than x less than 1. But now we have to check our endpoints every time, so there's no exception to that. I guess, well, there actually, well, there is kind of. Uh, x equals negative 1. Well, we got to go back up to the original way up here. n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n, negative 1 to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 3. So we have to decide if this is alternating or not. n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the 3n plus 1 over 2n plus 3. So if I plug 0 in, 0 plus 1 is, well, that's odd. If we plug 1 in, 3 plus 1 is 4, that's even. So this is actually alternating. This is an alternating series. If it wasn't, I would just make it negative 1 or positive 1. All right. So now let's use the alternating series test. We have the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over 2n plus 3 is equal to 0. The denominator is getting big. So it passes the nth term test. Then we have to say that 1 over 2n plus 5 is less than 1 over 2n plus 3. Are you 100% confident in that statement, or do we have to take derivative? We're good, right? We're good because we're not, we don't have to mess with the numerators. So this converges by alternating series test. All right, so we got one, negative 1 out of the way. How about 1? x equals 1. n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n, and then 1 to the 2n plus 1, which is just 1 over 2n plus 3. So converges by alternating series test because it's the exact, it's not the exact same series, but it's alternating and the denominator is 2n plus 3. So the results are going to be exactly the same and I already did the work for that. So I wouldn't expect the work again. I don't think that'd be necessary. So the interval of convergence is negative 1 to 1 and we would include the both endpoints. Good on that one? All right. Oh, five big points here. Sets up the ratio. So looking for that. Now they don't have the limit statement at the beginning because they're just setting it up. Now they have the limit statement. Computes the limit of the ratio. So it ends up being x squared, identifies the interior, considers both endpoints. So you got to show me something with both endpoints. Whether it's right or wrong, you get the point. And that's what's nice about, kind of what's nice about these free response. Analysis. Analysis, I would look for converges by alternating series and then and, and the interval. And then, of course, finally the answer. So those three things would be worth one point. That's how I would interpret this rubric. Oh, did we, didn't, we didn't finish the problem. Jeez. I thought I was just done. Uh, B. The Maclaurin series for G evaluated x equals 1 half is an alternating series whose terms decrease in absolute value to 0. The approximation for G of 1 half using the first two non-zero terms of this series happens to be 17 over 120. Show that this approximation differs from G of 1 half by less than 1 over 200. Talk about it. Give it a try. This one's really easy if you know what to do. If you don't know what to do, it's really hard, though.
sounds like a lot of you are on the right track, which is good. Uh, the McLaurin, so the first sentence says that this is a convergent series. That's all it says. What I really need to know is that the approximation that we used, and we used one half, is the first two non-zero terms. That's what I need to know. And the approximation differs from the exact, meaning the error, show that the error is less than 1 over 200. So that is the value of the next, of the first omitted term. So we've used, these are already used up. We plugged one half into those, got one over, 17 over 120. So this is the most the error can possibly be for those two terms when we plug one half in. So you might see this notation. The absolute value of the remainder, which is the error, of the third degree, I know it said the first two terms, but it's the third degree of x is less than or equal to the absolute value of one half to the fifth over seven, the next, the first omitted term or the next term, which is equal to one over 32 times seven, which is equal to one over 14, carry the one, 224, which the final statement I'm going to look for is less than 1 over 200. you got to kind of, it's like answering the question. It's making the final statement. This is what you wanted. You wanted me to show you that the error is less than 1 over 200. What's C? Write the first three non-zero terms and the general term of the Maclaurin series for G prime of X. So now we're taking the derivative. This is a representation of G. So G prime is... One third, three fifths x squared plus five x to the fourth over seven. And they want the general term. Now, they're starting this with zero, so we might as well start ours with zero also. So if you're assuming we're starting with zero, oh, you write it. You do that part. What's the general term? Anyone could take the derivative by now. All right, so first of all, it's alternating. So we need negative 1 to the n. Because if I start out with 0, that will be positive, And that's what we want. Uh, 1, 3, 5, that's odds. So uh, 2n would be evens. And then plus 1 would start where we need it to at 1. That would be odds. The denominator is also odds, but it starts with 3. So there would be even. If we add 3, we're going to get all odds. And then x to the 2n. There we go. There's your general term for the derivative. But what would we do with that power there if we took the derivative? Wouldn't we multiply it down in the front? And then what would it be if we reduce that by 1? 2n. See it? It works. I mean, it better work, right? Okay. Uh, I talked about the first one because I thought we were done. Uh, there it is. There's the next term. Is exactly what I wrote. And then, oh, one uses the third term as an error bound. So if I saw that, I'd be looking for this, uh, and then the error bound. So I'd be looking for that in combination with making that statement. First three terms. 
So that's worth the point there. And then one for all of that. <laughs> Don't mess it up. You're going to lose the point. Here we go. Turn it over. Give that one a try. Find the interval of convergence. You only have two choices. It's either not geometric, so you use the ratio, or it's geometric. One or the other. So I, I feel good that most of you, if not all of you, can set this up fairly easily. Uh, make sure that, you know, you run the 2 through. So it's 2 times n plus 1. So that's where we get the 2n plus 2. But now reducing the factorials can be a little tricky. This is like, let's say I pick a number. Let's say I pick 4 for n. So 8 over 10. So 8 factorial over 10 factorial. And I need to get the factorial out of there. We need to reduce this somehow. But we try to make something the same. And I could do that, 8 factorials in there. But then it's times 9 times 10. That's, that's still 10 factorial. And now that allows us to cancel those out. So over here, it's going to be 2n factorial over 2n factorial, but then times 2n plus 1, the next one, and then the next one, like that. Because we got to get to 2n plus 2. This ends up being one extra x minus two on top, and then on the bottom, the two, you know, these are gonna fat cancel out. So we get two n plus one, and two n plus two is what's left when we cancel out the, the common factorial, if you will. Well, if the denominator is headed to infinity, it, you know, we're gonna pick some value for x. So the, the top is gonna be constant once we pick an x, but the denominator is headed off to infinity, so of course that's gonna be zero. That's always less than one. So the interval of convergence is negative infinity to infinity. And earlier I said we always check the endpoints. Well, this is the exception. We don't check infinity. It just, that's it. Try that one. At least get it started, and then I'll catch up to you. This one's got, if I remember right, you know, quite a bit of work to it here. <clears throat> two n plus five, two n plus three, x minus five to the n, 
And let's see, with the n's, we're going to have 2 over 2. So that goes, that piece goes to 1, and then we just have, whoops, I don't need limit. Then uh, we have an extra x minus 5 on top. So negative 1 less than x minus 5 less than 1. Uh, 4 is less than x is less than 6. So 4 to 6. So let's check 4. n equals 0 to infinity of, that's the negative 1 to the n over 2n plus 3. Now we're not asked about absolute convergence or conditional, so let's just do the alternating series test. We have the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over 2n plus 3 uh, is uh, equal to 0, so it passes the nth term test. Then we have to say 1 over 2n plus 5 is less than 1 over 2n plus 3. No variables in the numerator, so we can say that with confidence. So this converges by alternating series tests. Then the other side, x equals 6, that should be the 1. n equals 0 to infinity of 6 minus 5 is 1, so 1 over 2n plus 3. Now this isn't alternating, so we can't use the alternating series test. Uh, we need to use the limit comparison test. So we need to compare this to something. And we compare this to either 1 over 2n or 1 over n. It doesn't matter because I can factor the 1 half out and it's still the harmonic series. So grab the 2 if you want, don't grab the 2, it doesn't matter. So this diverges by harmonic series. Now we just have to show that they diverge together. So limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over 2n plus 3 times n over 1. Well, that equals 1 half. If we were to grab the 2, it would just be 1. But either, either numbers are positive and finite. So we just say which is positive and finite. So this, they diverge together. So it diverges by limit comparison test. All right, so the interval of convergence, we finally have to answer the question, is equal to it was good at 4 and does not converge at 6. Everybody good there? All right, last one. Here we go. What do you see? Yeah, it's geometric, isn't it? Yeah, this one goes real quick. It's a little tricky, though. With the 2n, it's a little tricky. Now this one, if you're not exactly sure what the r is, you can always write out a couple, a few terms. It'd be x minus 3 over to, uh, to second over 4, and then plus x minus 3. When I plug 2 in, that'd be 4 over uh, 16. And maybe if you're still not seeing it, we go, uh, if you plug 3 in, that's 6 over 64. So look how the powers are increasing by 2 every time because we have the 2 in. So the r is uh, x minus 3 squared over, um, well, just over 4, right? Yeah, 4 times 4 times 4, just multiplying by 4 every time. Now, because this is squared, we don't need the absolute value yet. We want the radius, or the radius, the uh, ratio to be less than 1. 
So x minus 3 squared is less than 4. So now when we square root, we get that absolute value back in here. So negative 2 less than x minus 3 less than 2. So 1 is less than x is less than 5. Now with geometric series, one of these, if you plug 1 in, you get um, negative, uh, negative 2, but you're squaring it. So you get 4 over 4. That'll be positive. And then when you plug 5 in, you're also getting positive 1. So this and both of them end up being 1 to infinity of um, 1 to the n, which is 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. Keep on going. That's headed off to infinity. So with geometric series, they're going to diverge at the endpoints. So your interval of convergence is 1 to 5. And I think AP usually does in inequalities, and I think this one's on the multiple choice. So you'll see 1 less than x less than 5.